that's up and running? Awesome, I love it. All right, guys, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Pretty good. All right, so we're going to do things a little bit differently today, but not really. The only difference really is I'm talking at you instead of her. So whether that's a good thing, bad thing, probably a bad thing. She's pretty great. That's um, that's a good thing. So anyhow, uh, I have met all of you now, but I don't know many of you well. Uh, so why am I qualified to stand up here and talk to you about this topic? Um, my name is Jeff. I'm from Rochester, New York, originally. Um, I know we have a couple Northerners, but not a ton, so uh, represent to all of you who are really down here now. Um, I graduated, I actually have two undergraduate degrees. My first one is in history. My second one is actually relevant. Um, <laughs> I went to the State University of New York at Brockport, and I graduated in 2014. Um, we know I'm a graduate student here. Okay, I'm in the exercise science program, obviously, that's why I'm here <coughs> talking to you, and that's how I met this young lady um, and <laughs> got contracted to help her out. So, um, I'm CSCS and all that. Um, if you haven't checked out this website, thestrengthcave.com, um, that is a project that my best buddy down here, Danny Bove, started, um, and I am a, a writer and a contributor and a coach. I write articles on there. Um, we try to write as much scientifically validated content about strength and conditioning as we can. Um, so that's a great resource. Um, if you read something that interests you, uh, you want to learn more, we are here in the building all the time. Uh, we're in the lab. So feel free to find one of us and talk to us. We would be more than happy to talk shop with you. Um, so take advantage of that because we're we do, we do okay. Um, now, this is why I'm really qualified to talk to you here. Uh, I've done a bajillion internships. Uh, I haven't made a dime for it, but it's been uh, a lot of fun, kind of. Uh, no, it's, it's really been a great experience. Um, I started at the University of Notre Dame, worked with the Olympic sports department there. Um, that was a lot of men's hockey, men's basketball. Uh, I worked with women's volleyball for all of their lifting practices, uh, baseball, men's swimming, men's tennis, women's soccer. Uh, those were the ones I worked most with, but I worked with every team at least a little bit, except for football. I did not work with football because they're um, a little bit secretive about their your question already, Aaron. Uh, yes. Uh, when did you uh, start your uh, internship experience? Um, I needed an internship to graduate from Brockport. Um, so I applied to a number of schools, and Notre Dame was the first one that took me. Okay. Um, so that was a great experience. Um, I don't know how many of you are interested in strength and conditioning. Uh, if you have no interest in strength and conditioning whatsoever, you're going to be super bored for the next hour. But um, if you're at least somewhat interested, uh, you know, hopefully I, I won't put you back to sleep or anything like that. Um, so that's where I started. Uh, I worked at UB, University of Buffalo. I worked both with the football team and with the Olympic sports. That was mostly, in this case, men's basketball, women's volleyball, uh, track and field and wrestling. The teams I worked most with there. And last year I worked with New York Yankees down here uh, during their voluntary off-season practices as well as uh, spring training and extended spring training. And the uh, Tampa Yankees high A affiliate for a little while during the season last year. Um, so that's me, that's who I am. Now, I give this disclaimer before any lecture that I give. Uh, the content that I'm about to deliver, I didn't invent any of this, okay? These are none of my original ideas, these are just things I have learned. So I always thank the people that influenced me most, uh, Ed Jaskolski and Nate Harvey, are my two main mentors. Um, I don't expect you to have heard of them, but they're absolutely phenomenal coaches. Uh, Ed's at Brockport and Nate's at UB, Director of Olympic Sports there. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, of reading and self-educating, those who have influenced me most are Louis Simmons and Dave Tate, um, yeah, at Westside and Elite FTS, respectively. Uh, Matt Wenning has done a lot uh, to educate me in terms of explaining what Louis has to say. Uh, if you have any idea who Louis Simmons is, you know, it's somewhat difficult to understand what he's talking about because uh, he's 
that brilliant, but can't really pare it down. Matt Lenning does that for him. Um, and since we're talking about speed development, uh, I have to mention Charlie Francis, who has influenced most of what I've learned about sprint speed, uh, as well as James Smith, and Buddy Morris, who's actually my mentor's mentor, uh, the strength coach with the Arizona Cardinals, uh, has influenced me a lot as well. So thank you to them. Now, here we go. Uh, what are we going to talk about today, okay? We're talking about sprint speed. <coughs> By and large, the commonality between most sports, team sports, court-based sports, track and field sports, is bipedal sprinting, okay? Moving as fast as possible on two legs. That is the commonality between almost any sport you're gonna find that's not in water. Um, that's even, you can even extrapolate that to being on ice. Hockey is a pure acceleration game. Um, so we're going to go over that. We're going to deconstruct the task of sprinting, okay? I'm going to use some big words. I'm going to explain what these mean, okay? If you have a question at any point, stop me, and I'll gladly field that question, okay? So feel free. <coughs> Don't feel like you're interrupting me or, or sounding, uh, you know, unintelligent. Um, we'll, we'll break this down together, okay? Um, we're going to talk about track and field, and we're going to talk about other sports too. Now, like I said, I'm a physical preparedness coach, okay? I'm not a track and field coach. I know we have at least one track athlete here, um, probably some other track and field enthusiasts. Is anyone here a track and field coach? Okay. Uh, neither am I, but I feel that to understand sprinting, you have to look at sprinting in its purest unadulterated form, which is track sprint. Okay. Then we can take what we learned from that, and we can apply it to other uh, arenas. Okay. Um, again, I'm strength conditioning physical preparedness coach. I like this term better, physical preparedness coach. Um, I was talking with him earlier about why. Uh, <coughs> the reason I don't like the term strength conditioning, and again, I didn't, I didn't come up with this conclusion. Uh, this is a conclusion drawn by my mentors. Um, but I agree, so I say, you know, I tell everyone that it was my idea. But uh, strength and conditioning suggests that it's a separate entity, that it's something segregated from the rest of athletic performance. Um, if we look at three main domains of preparing an athlete to optimize performance, we have to consider technical, tactical. Okay, so that's sport technique, that's strategy, that's uh, intellectual portions of the sport. We have physical preparedness, okay, preparing the body both in terms of general physical preparedness and specific for the sport, uh, and also the therapeutic recovery, physical therapy, athletic training domain. Um, those are not separate. We need to consider the cumulative load that's placed on an athlete through everything they do during the day, okay? So I can bring athletes into the weight room and I can absolutely crush them. Will that help them when they go out to practice? Absolutely not. Um, if they go to practice first, uh, and that largely depends on schedules, on the, on the sport coach, uh, sometimes they're gonna be crushed when they come into the weight room. Am I gonna load them up and crush them more? No, because that's gonna put them in a deep hole. Um, Later in the presentation, we're going to go over supercompensation theory, gas theory, all that, um, stress management uh, in terms of training stress, not in terms of like you know taking exams and stuff, and you know, but uh, that actually all plays into it. And I'll go over that, but look at it as a holistic approach to developing an athlete. Okay, physical preparedness coach, athletic trainer, physical therapist and especially the head sport coach, have to all be on the same page, okay? We're developing the athlete as well. Um, <clears throat> people think that sprinters are born, which is true. It takes incredible genetic gifts to run fast. However, Usain Bolt didn't run 958 and 100 at age 16. He ran it much later than that. If Usain Bolt can get faster, anybody can get faster, okay? This is a skill. We need to go over how to get fast and how to get strong in order to maximize this, 
Okay, and that's very possible, and I'm going to go over how to do that. So, that's where we're headed today. <coughs> Big words. Okay, so we're going to go over these one by one. If we're going to deconstruct any movement task, we have to look at three domains, okay? Biomotor, biodynamic, bioenergetic. Are we confused? Have I lost you? No. Okay, you're still with me. Good. Because I'm going to explain what they mean. That's good, all right? Okay, biomotor ability. Jeff, when you can I talk. stop you just a second? Ah, yes, go ahead. Um, this will be on your next celebration of knowledge, just kind of FYI. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> When you think about ways that we describe athletes, say, oh man, that's a really, really strong athlete. Very fast, very flexible. Okay? We're talking about biomotor ability. Okay? Strength, speed, power, flexibility. Those are what we call biomotor domains. And we're going to go over how those apply to the movement task of sprinting. Okay? Biodynamics. We're talking biomechanics world here. Now, you haven't taken biomechanics yet. I believe you take it next semester. Um, so I'll try to keep it somewhat simple. Um, but I'll give you a little jump start in, in how we think about that here in the presentation. Okay, so uh, you can thank me when you get to biomechanics and say, oh, I've seen this stuff before. Okay. And bioenergetic, I know for a fact you have the help of that. These are our energy systems. Uh, you guys have probably beat that to death at this point, I would assume. Yeah. Um, and you're only going to learn it over and over and over again. Because it's uh, kind of important to provide energy for how we move. Wow, another big slide. Okay. Again, this is an introductory slide. We're going to break all this down and talk about it in its constituent parts so don't get overwhelmed this point. Okay? But this is where we're going to start. All this does is take our sprinting. We have our three domains here. Okay? For the moment, this is how we're going to think about sprinting. We're going to think about it in terms of time and distance. Okay? The farther we get for an effort, all of these change. Okay? So right now we're thinking in terms of a track race. The start coming out of the blocks. Okay? Our buyer motor abilities that allow us to be successful at that point in the race are right here. Okay? And I'm going to explain what all of these mean very shortly. So don't be lost yet. Okay? Here we're talking about joint angles for our biodynamic domain. Okay, so don't really worry about that. This is something that a track coach is going to worry about, which is not me. So we're just going to move on. And again, as we know, our intensity and the duration of our effort is going to affect the bioenergetic system that's primarily contributing to our effort. Okay, so uh, ATPCP which is probably what you've learned it as. Um, if I use the term alactic, those are synonymous. Okay, that means the same thing. All right? So obviously, as we get farther, 200 meters, four, especially 400 meters, extremely lactic. Okay, there's not much that hurts worse than a 400 meter race. Okay? That's true. It's very true. Okay, that is a very, very difficult internal environment to handle and still continue to run fast. Uh, that's why it's one of the hardest races on the track. Okay. If you didn't get this, don't worry. We're going to take each one of those elements and break them down. Okay. Now again, I'm not a track coach, but I feel that you have to look at the 100 meters to understand pure sprint. Okay. Usain Bolt ran 958 in 2009 at the World Championship. That is the current world record. Okay? I'll promise I'll tie this all together. I'm giving you a lot of information and a lot of charts. I'll explain all of them. Okay, that's the last time I said that because I feel like I've told you that like a million times. Okay? What I want you to notice here, okay? 
This is Usain Bolt's splits every 20 meters. This is the, uh, the mean data for the rest of the field, okay, everybody else in the race. What do we notice, okay? Well, he's already had most of them at 20 meters. Why this is significant, we'll go over that in a little bit, okay? But we'll really want to notice these velocities right here as compared to these. Usain Bolt reaches a much higher velocity in meters per second. He's the fastest man in the world, obviously. Okay? We're trying to reach max velocity. Max velocity is the main determinant of performance in 100 meters. Okay? Much higher there. Also check this deceleration over the last 20 meters. Significantly higher for the rest of the field. Okay. Let's look at him as compared to bronze medalist this off of Powell. Powell has a better start, and that's about where the race ends. Okay? Again, max velocity here, 12.35. That is astronomically fast. That's unreal. He's world record holder, obviously, for a reason. I believe he's lowered the world record by um, like two tenths of a second, which is un unbelievable. Um, but again, higher max velocity. Also notice where it's achieved, okay? Usain Bolt hits his max at 70, Powell at 60. We're gonna go over why that's important as well, okay? The other thing to notice from this slide is 30 meters in, they both have hit 90% of the max velocity, which means that from the start to 30, that's where almost all of the acceleration is happening. Okay, that's significant as well. We're gonna apply that now as well, okay? So again, higher velocity for Bolt. We're gonna go over what this means, okay? Bolt's acceleration phase is longer. His deceleration is shorter. That's very important in terms of bioenergetic considerations. <clears throat> Bolt's about five inches taller than a soft pop, okay? Those of us who are long-limbed have a disadvantage in terms of acceleration, okay? Because we simply have longer to move. But you saw Bolt wasn't that far behind Powell at 10 meters. Theoretically, someone with long limbs like Bull shouldn't be able to accelerate nearly as well as someone like Powell. And if you look at the two of them side by side, they're built completely different. Okay? Powell is really built. The dude's jacked. Okay? <clears throat> built much more like a football player than a sprinter. And football players are typically very good sprinters. But if acceleration is what we're going for. If you actually look at a track and field thrower, shot putter, or if you look at an Olympic weightlifter, because they have such good starting strength and such good uh, relative strength, their acceleration is actually really, really good. Um, offensive linemen can typically match a wide receiver in the first five to 10 meters. After that, they like. Okay? But this is why Usain Bolt is a freak. He shouldn't be able to accelerate like that. He's much more designed for top end velocity. And we saw that on the last side. He achieves an incredible max velocity. However, he minimizes this disadvantage somehow because he's a freak. And then he finishes the race looking around with his hands. Okay. We're going to go over all that. Okay. Takeaway point number one. First 30 meters. Team sports, you're never gonna run more than 30. The only time you'll ever do that is maybe on a kick return in football. However, you don't really have a chance to achieve max velocity because you're never gonna go in a straight line. Okay, track and field is the only place you're gonna see un, uh, unadulterated straight line sprinting. Okay, 30 meters, remember that. Now, 
told you we were going to go over all these one by one. So let's start. Okay. Five minutes. We're going to go over different classifications of strength. Okay. Strength. Uh, in its simplest form, simplest way to describe it is just the ability to exert force. Okay? But then we can break that down into a number of different subclassifications, which are all super, super important. Okay? Maximum strength is the force you can achieve with no time limit. So think powerlifting. Okay? You can take a minute and a half to lift that weight. I mean, obviously, you're going to, that's not realistic. But you can take five, six, seven, eight seconds to lift a weight as long as you don't uh, lose your lose the momentum of the lift. Okay? There's no time limit. You get all the time you need. <clears throat> Our absolute strength, okay, the absolute max force that a muscle can pull with, okay? We can only measure this by taking electrodes, putting them on each end of the muscle and shocking. Okay? Our brain limits the ability to exert our maximum force. Why? Because your muscle is plenty strong to rip itself off of the bone. Okay. You all hear the stories every once in a while about the 95-pound woman who like rips off a car door if her, her child is like trapped inside. That is absolute strength. Okay? That's a survival mechanism that is completely involuntary, okay? We will never achieve this level of strength voluntarily. That's only an absolute life or death situation, and the reason why is because you will probably rip muscles off bones, and this is, our body is self-protective, and it doesn't allow us to achieve that amount of force. The goal with lifting weights, increasing strength capacity, is actually decreasing the gap between what you can achieve voluntarily and your absolute possible strength capacity. Okay? So as we get trained, we close that gap and we're able to voluntarily produce closer and closer to the ceiling of absolute maximum force. Okay? <clears throat> Relative strength is our strength divided by our body weight. Okay, that's very important for a lot of sports, especially weight class sports, uh, but team sports as well, very, very important. Um, starting strength, just what it sounds like, how strong you are at the beginning of the contraction. Okay, so something like starting strength is going to help with a lift where you're coming from the floor from a dead stop. Deadlift, Olympic lifts, okay, great examples of that. Acceleration strength, once you've started it, keep it going, okay. How quickly can you build momentum? of the weight. This is where we get into more relevant domains <coughs> for our I sports. We had a question. Well, let's go back. Thank you. What's up? Hey, uh, you said um, from absolute strength um, the brain kind of inhibits? Yes. Inhibits what? Uh, inhibits the ability to produce that force. Uh, do you know what percentage that you see that you normally use, like an untrained person? <coughs> untrained person would be very, very, very small percentage. Yeah. Um, I don't know our exact numbers. Okay. Um, it also depends on the situation. It depends on the depends on the task. Okay. Um, <coughs> so motor unit recruitment is going to be the main constituent in that. Um, I believe we're going to get a chance to go over that a little bit later uh, as it applies to both sprinting and to lifting uh, when we get into a more practical portion of how we apply this to the weight room setting. Okay. Um, explosive strength is going to be the most relevant to most sports. Okay. Why? Because I said <coughs> maximum strength or maximum force capacity powerlifting type of efforts have no time limit, like I mentioned. On a football field, you have a real important time limit because you got a dude come and trying to rip your head off. Okay? We never have all the time we need to produce force in a consistently moving game. Okay? 
Therefore, the objective is to exert maximal force in minimal time. So with the time that we are allotted to apply force to the ground, to the person, to whatever we're applying force to, how much of our maximal strength can we actually exert in that time, okay? So people love talking about being explosive. What does that mean? All that means is being able to apply as much force as possible in as little time as possible. Okay. Reactive elastic strength. <clears throat> this is especially important when we hit max velocity. With max velocity, the muscles are uh, not necessarily the driving force behind our effort. Have we been over a stretch shortening cycle? No. Okay. <clears throat> when a muscle is stretched, okay, there's kinetic energy that's produced when the muscle is stretched. Okay? So that's the muscle connective tissue, that's also the tendon. The tendon's also stretched. Okay, tendons which attach muscles to bones. Okay. <clears throat> when that happens, we can utilize that energy to actually increase the force of contraction on the concentric portion. Okay. So think of like a spring. Okay. This. Okay. Stretch. Contract more force. Okay. A lot, a lot, a lot of the speed that we can produce at max velocity is because of the stretching and the contracting of the Achilles tendon. Okay. Why, when we do a vertical jump, do we not just do this? Because it can't produce any force. Okay? We produce a preload on the muscle and a preload on the tendons by doing this. This is why we jump from here. Okay? We don't just do that. Why? Because we can utilize that stress shortening cycle and increase the energy that's available to contract the muscle. Okay? So that's very important. Um, strength endurance, simply ability to repeat. The effort, speed, performance, movements in minimal time, okay? We can also talk about agility, coordination, flexibility, that sort of thing in here. Um, general endurance, but I've given you a lot of terms, so we won't worry about that, okay? Yeah. Yeah, is the uh, last strength, is that the stretch and reflex? Is that what yes, exactly. Yep. <clears throat> and some people that are more springy, naturally, have the ability to better utilize that. Uh, so you see this a lot when you work with football. Um, if you have football players do reactive jumps, so a series of jumps, one after the other, you're typically going to see most of your skill players just kind of just kind of bounce, like like a bouncy ball, okay? Whereas your linemen typically are going to require a little more strength to accomplish that task. So instead of just bouncing, you're going to see them usually drop lower and take more time to load up and come into the jump again. Um, <clears throat> sprinters typically are one of those two builds that I talked about before with Powell and Bolt. Bolt is super, super springy. Okay? He has phenomenal elastic strength. Powell is more powerful. He's built more for starting. Okay? And we'll go over the difference between acceleration phase and max velocity phase are really, really similar. Um, so that's, that's that. Force velocity curve, this is my favorite thing ever, okay? I talk about this in almost every lecture that I get, okay? Throwing a lot at you, okay? Again, any questions, feel free to slow me down. When we look at exerting force, we talked about this earlier. Force and velocity are inversely proportional to one another. So again, the greatest displays of strength happen at the slowest velocities. A one rep max power lift, that thing ain't moving fast, okay? You're struggling, you're grinding through, it's not moving fast, but you're able to exert phenomenal force because you have all that time to build up motor improvement, okay? On the other side of the continuum is pure speed, okay? That's minimal 
force, okay, at the highest velocity, okay? Those who can achieve high levels of force in small levels of time, which we just talked about, are those who succeed at speed-based sports, which is most sports. Uh, in the middle, we have the intermediate ranges, okay? Maximum power is achieved somewhere in the middle. So the highest power levels that we're gonna see, uh, aside from pure sprinting and elite sprinters, are Olympic lifts and dynamic upper power lifts. Okay? So that's where force and velocity, their product is maximized in the middle. Because okay? up here you're gonna have high force but low velocity, down here you're gonna have high velocity and low force. In the middle is where they are maximized. Okay? And again, this is kind of the explosive strength, speed strength uh, range. Okay. <coughs> These are all determinants. Rate of force development, so how fast can we produce the force? Highly related to what we just talked about. Starting strength, reactive elastic strength. Elastic strength. We need to train all of these because if we do work anywhere on this curve, it'll affect us everywhere in a positive way. But we're trying to get this whole curve to shift upwards. So we're trying to exert more force at every single velocity. And that's going to make our ability to perform in athletic movements much better. What would be an example of the difference between strength, speed, and speed strength? <coughs> the, uh, simply think of, it's easiest to think about it in terms of lifting weight. Okay. This is your 70 to 80 percent, 100 max range. This is more like your 30. Biodynamic, one of my favorites, probably my least favorite. Uh, we're going to consider when we look at a movement, we're going to consider the group of muscles involved, okay, the range of motion, time domain, we've talked about that already, okay, and the type of work we're doing. Okay. This is where different sports are going to differ from one another. However, since we're talking about sprinting, and sprinting is very common across all sports, not as much of a difference here as you might think. Can you go back a yeah, sure. <coughs> and you'll send me these slides so I can post them? Of course. Excellent, thank you. Of course. <coughs> Whoever's phone keeps buzzing over here, would you do something with it? I swear I'm not making things out. Physics. Is anybody taking physics? Oh, yeah. Luckily, we don't need to go past Newtonian physics here. Okay? I'm not a physics guy. I try to try to float, try to figure it out. But three laws of motion, extremely important. Okay, you'll probably learn about this on day one of biomechanics, or at least when you start covering actual biomechanics, I think you go over kinesiology stuff first. Um, <coughs> first law, okay? Object at rest, stays at rest, until acted on by an unbalanced force, okay? Thinking about sprinting here, because we're gonna apply this. If we come out of the blocks, or we come from a three-point stance, four-point stance, off the ground, wherever. We have to overcome the static inertia that we have. So we have to go from rest to really fast as quickly as we can, okay? We have to apply an unbalanced force to the ground in order to move us along, which leads us into number two, okay? Acceleration, force divided by mass. We talked about relative strength. That's exactly what this is. Okay, your maximum strength divided by your body weight. Okay, so those with extremely impressive relative strength 
can accelerate very, very well. Also, for those of you that want to get CSCS certified, the CSCS book is going to tell you that sprint speed is achieved by stride length times stride frequency, which is true. However, those are not the causes of running faster. Those are the effects of running faster. The cause of running faster is applying more force to the ground, which leads us into law three, equal opposite reaction, okay? We're not gonna talk about friction or any of that, but we are gonna get into force application and force vectors a little bit. I'm just gonna mention the term force vectors, you'll learn that. In biomechanics. <coughs> This is an awful mark. into the ground. Equal and opposite reaction. Force is applied back into him. Okay. And he moves along the track at 12.3 meters per second. Okay. Just as simple as that. Okay. Force vector is simply a, a direction or magnitude of force. Okay. Kind of like how all the energy systems are always in play, there's always going to be a vertical vector and a horizontal vector for sprinting. Okay. In the acceleration phase, which we're going to go over, there's going to be more of a horizontal force vector, which means you're going to be pushing more behind you, getting you to come more this way. As you come upright in your max velocity sprinting position, there's going to be more of a vertical uh, vector that's expressed there. Okay. Now here's the paradox of sprinting. <coughs> When we start, there's more ground contact time. Okay? So there's more time to put this force into the ground because we're moving slower. We're going from a static start to max velocity. So those who are stronger are able to do really well in the acceleration because they can have more time to apply this force. That's why Olympic weightlifters, track and field throwers, Offensive linemen and all that are very good accelerating because they're very strong. <coughs> As we accelerate to max velocity, there's slower, sorry, slower, less and less opportunity to apply force to the ground. That's where reactive strength and rate of force development are incredibly important because the faster you're going, the less time you have to apply this force. Therefore, you have to exert more force in that time that's available to you. Explosive strength that we're talking about. Acceleration phase. I just led into this, okay? We have to break from a static start. Starting strength, acceleration strength are going to be critical in this phase, okay? Because we're going to need to accelerate as fast as we can, get our speed up as fast as we can, put the most force into the ground at this phase as we can, okay? Explosive strength and rate of force development is super important. Again, with each step we take, our ground contact time is going to decrease. So the faster we can apply this force, the better. A reactive elastic strength stretch shortening cycle is involved at the outset of the race. It's not the primary driving force until later, but these components are involved. They're only secondary at this point. Okay? Talked about vectors, talked about powerful explosive athletes already. Okay, so let's look at it. Forward lean. We want a complete extension of the whole body. So he's not quite at full extension yet. He will be in a split second after this photo is taken. Okay, 
But what do we notice? Straight line from his big toe all the way to his head. Okay? Stronger athletes are going to be able to achieve a greater forward lean, which is advantageous in terms of acceleration. Airplanes don't take off like that. They take off like this, right? Same type of deal. We want to have maximum horizontal force application at the start. Those with weaker spinal erectors will have a harder time, and also weaker glutes will have a harder time holding this position. So an untrained or a weaker sprinter is going to be more upright sooner. Okay. Uh, the world record in the late 80s run by Ben Johnson, who got it taken away because of D-ball, um, still is the fastest anyone's ever run, except for Bolt. Um, I think Palm uh, and Tyson Gay may have beat him now. But he was one of the best starters ever. He was also one of the strongest people to ever sprint. Um, 600 pounds times six on the squat. Um, That's the Usain Bolt. This is Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt didn't do that. That was, that was Ben Johnson I was talking about. Oh, okay. Uh, Usain Bolt is not very strong. Um, he's, again, we went over before, his elastic components are, are very good. Not that he's not strong, he's extremely strong. He's, But I've seen videos of him lifting weights and it's awful. <laughs> um, anyhow, so strength considerations are gonna help us hit this acceleration position. We want our head and neck to be neutral. So he's looking about maybe two or three meters ahead of him. Okay, when you come out of the blocks, if you raise your head prematurely, the rest of the body's gonna follow and you're gonna come upright faster, okay? Uh, typically, we're going to see about 38% of the strides in the 100 meters run in some sort of acceleration position. So 62% fully upper. Okay. <coughs> Positive shin angle. What does that mean? It means that our knee is ahead of our toes. Okay. I love to talk about posterior chain strength and how it relates to speed and how it relates to anything we do in an athletic context. However, this is a quad dominant portion here. Okay. In terms of knee action, we're going to think, okay, he's going to have to drive his knees forward. Okay? If he drives this knee forward, he's going to contralaterally drive this hip backwards. Okay? Also super important is the arms. Arms are connected to the opposite leg, so the more extension, the more violently you can extend at the shoulder, you're going to see a contralateral extension of the opposite hip. Okay? The more extension of the hip you get, provided you can uh, apply force and power in that position, the faster you're going to accelerate. Okay. <clears throat> Bolt doesn't open his elbow up a lot. Some people will open their elbow up completely at the start. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> As we get upright, the angle of the elbow is going to start to close a little bit, more towards that 90 degrees. But at the start, there's going to be more extension at the elbow, and that's to help with extension of the hip. Okay? Um, it also helps to, uh, to balance out the rotation of the hips at the start position. And we want to think about driving down, down, down. Okay? We want to minimize energy leaks. I'm going to show you his world record performance on YouTube in a minute here. Um, Bolt has energy leaks. Bolt could run faster if he goes stronger. Okay? When you see him come out of the blocks, there's a lot of this. There's a lot of rocking. He also has a lot of rocking at his max velocity. If he got that sorted out, oh my gosh. And if he actually ran through 100 meters. <laughs> He's getting a little old now, and there's not much he has left to accomplish, so who knows if he'll get there, but he can run faster, um, and that's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Max velocity pace now. Like I said, 62% of the races run in a max velocity pace. So now, notice the difference here. <clears throat> Straight up and down. Okay. Close elbows here. Still more than 90 but less than 
what you might see here. Okay. Here we're switching much more to that stress sh shortening cycle. Okay. Achilles tendon and other tendons are much more involved here. This is primarily posterior development. That's important here. Okay. Our hamstrings and our glutes are the main drivers in this phase as opposed to our more of our quads and our glutes in the acceleration phase. Um, again, the more force you can apply to the track at very, very minimal ground contact times here, the better you're going to be. Um, this was a landmark study that proved what sprint coaches have said since the beginning of time that faster spinners apply more force to the track in less time. Um, but this, they actually looked at that in both trained and untrained spinners. Um, as we get longer, speed endurance comes into play. What does that mean? We can only accelerate for a finite amount of time. After that, we're trying to minimize deceleration. Okay? Once you hit max velocity, you're just trying to maintain. We'll go over how that all comes into play later. Um, going over it a little so you can see it a little bit better. Here's acceleration phase, okay? Line of extension, positive shin angle here. In a second, you'll see more of this type of angle, which I drew on you saying right here. Transitioning to upright running. Elite sprinters, which I'm definitely not, will tell you that at max velocity, they don't really feel anything. Um, being as relaxed as possible will help you run as fast as possible. And they almost feel like they're just stepping down, stepping down, stepping down, stepping down. Contrast that with acceleration, where every step has to be a concerted effort to drive force down, 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 down. Okay. <coughs> We talked about elbow, we talked about being upright, we talked about the Achilles tendon, okay? This foot's neutral right here, maybe a little bit dorsiflex. That's preloading the Achilles tendon, so when he steps down, that pre-stretch is going to help rocket him up. Um, kangaroos. Kangaroos have an Achilles tendon that's like my forearm, and that's how they can jump so far, so high. Um, it's really pretty great. Good question. Uh, you said that um, the uh, acceleration phase was posterior and then the quads mostly, and then once you get to max velocity, it, it's more just the posterior? Yes, yeah, so the emphasis is going to switch from quads during the acceleration phase. Glutes are always involved. Glutes are super, super, super important for sprinting. Um, that's why if you look at if you look at the field in 100 meters, these dudes have big butts. Like, they cannot lie. Yes, they cannot lie. They're all about that, that anaconda stuff. <laughs> they, yeah, they are extremely powerful. But again, with the, with the positive shin angle, you're going to see the quads being more involved. Um, and then hamstrings are more involved in next boss. Um, bioenergetic considerations. Okay, as we know, all three systems are always involved. However, primary emphasis changes depending on duration and intensity of exercise. Well, for our purposes, we're going to extend this to eight seconds. We're going to print that as eight. Okay, that's around how long anybody can accelerate. Now, whether you're at seventy meters or thirty if you are super slow, that's around how much time you can accelerate for. <clears throat> for our purposes, in terms of the 100 meter sprint, or any sprints for that matter, we're going to say that's a lap. Okay? The amount of time that you can accelerate for, that's going to be all phosphorus system. Okay? <clears throat> when glycolysis Lactate starts being produced, you can't accelerate anymore. You're tapped out. Okay. If we go back all the way back a long time ago when we talked about this stuff, 
Usain Bolt accelerates through 70, Powell through 60. Usain has to run 30 meters with lactate starting to accumulate, Powell has to run 40. Notice the drop off. There's a 2% decrease in velocity for Usain Bolt. There's a 7% decrease in velocity for Powell. Bolt reaches his top speed, which is greater, later in the race, which means he has to run a shorter distance in extremely fatiguing in an uh, internal environment that's making it difficult to perform that task. Okay. So we refer to that as the alactic threshold. It's the amount of distance you can cover under alactic ATPPC conditions before you start to accumulate lactate. Okay? So the goal of pure sprinting is to be farther down the track when that starts to happen, because you'll see less of a deceleration. So this is just a review here. Now, here's the real treat. We're going to